Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Jenny Wenger, and I'm Director of Programs here with the Linux Foundation Public Health, and I'm really excited to welcome you to our February webinar, uh, which is all about how we work with data, uh, and specifically COVID data. So uh, I'll start just a little bit of background about Linux Foundation Public Health, in case you're not familiar with us. We are a nonprofit part of the uh, and we are one of the organizations within the Linux Foundation overall. We specialize in open source software and bringing open source software in uh, to public health and making it available uh, and usable and developing the entire ecosystem around this software. So we uh, are focused right now on COVID. Uh, we've got several uh, open source projects within the exposure notification space for countries and public health authorities who want to develop exposure notification apps. Uh, and then we also have the COVID Credentials Initiative, which is working on standards and community building around verifiable credentials. So these are two uh, critical things that we're working on uh, right now. And then we're expanding further into other projects as time goes by to make sure that we have, uh, that we have everything um, ready for the next pandemic, but also dealing with population health challenges with uh, tracking and monitoring of disease uh, and really set it, you know, making sure that there's a software stack available for all public health authorities to be successful. Uh, if you do wanna get involved with LFPH, uh, you've got a couple of options. Uh, you can join our Slack and start to see what we're doing there at slack.lfph.io. Uh, you can uh, sign up for our newsletter at the bottom of our homepage. And uh, you could also, if you want to get involved with the project and start contributing uh, code or copy or um, feedback, there's all sorts of different ways to get involved with projects. And we'd be happy to connect you to that as well. I'll put all that information in the chat in a minute. Uh, today's presentation, uh, we're so glad to welcome Chris Kelly from COVID Act Now. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with COVID Act Now, it is a really fantastic website that gives you data about how COVID is doing not only uh, across the U.S. but within each count within each state and county. Uh, it uses a variety of metrics to help you understand how the outbreaks uh, might be going and uh, help you really decide how to what to do with regards to your own behavior. They are an open source project, a nonprofit, and are doing some amazing work uh, and we're so glad to have them here today. So uh, just a little bit, uh, the recording and slides will be available afterwards. Uh, they'll be emailed out to everybody who registered for the event and then we'll also be posting it on our YouTube and you can find it on our website. Uh, and this event is governed by the Linux Foundation Code of Public Health Code of Conduct. Uh, I'll drop the link to that in the chat as well. For Q&A, uh, please ask questions uh, throughout the entire uh, the entire presentation. Uh, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And uh, you can also upvote questions that you see other people asking so that we make sure we get to them at the end. Uh, we will be doing all of the questions at the end, uh, but please do feel free to enter them as, as you think of them. Uh, and with that, I am thrilled to pass it off to Chris. Uh, to tell us all about what he's learned uh, working with COVID data for the past nearly year. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Jenny. Let me get my the screen sharing properly. Um, great. Does that look good? Um, wonderful. Well, thank you all for coming today. Um, my name is Chris Kelly and I am an engineer at COVID Act now. Um, I've been working and helping out there since uh, about late March of last year. Um, and it's been really an honor and I've been super excited to be able to help out in, in uh, the response to this pandemic. Um, thank you to Jenny for this opportunity to present. Um, it's been really cool seeing the Linux Foundation for Public Health and what they're doing and their mission to really support open source movements and open source uh, software in regards to public health is really amazing. And I think uh, there's so much opportunity for there to be a huge impact for what open source software can bring um, to the public health space. And it will really increase um, just the effectiveness of what people are able to do. Um, and so, yeah, today we'll be talking about um, how 
your COVID data can have um, impact and how it's important for that data to be accessible to all. Um, oops, let's see, there we go. Um, yeah, so quick overview. I'll give you a brief uh, uh, broad introduction to what COVID Act now does. I'll help explain what does accessible data actually mean. Um, and then I'll talk about characteristics of that data and how you can identify it in your own context. Um, and then we'll have a QA and a at the end. Um, and I'm really hoping that we can help you spot ways that make your data more accessible to others. So if you are presenting data, I want to be able to help you uh, understand where pitfalls might be uh, and have a larger tool set to really under, to communicate that data in the best way possible. Um, so what role has COVID Act Now played so far? Um, first of all and foremost, we have the covidactnow.org website. And it is a primarily a, a data tracker and risk tracker that services various COVID information um, in a variety of different ways. And how we've done this has really changed over the pandemic. Um, the at the beginning, it was more about hospitalization prediction and how will that hospitalization data change. Um, and it's evolved. Right now, vaccines are just coming online. And so we put a lot more effort into understanding how um, and understanding how vaccine distribution is going across the country and providing people with tools. Um, all this data on the website is powered by data pipelines that, that aggregate and collect all this data by state, county, and metro area levels. So it provides data at a similar way um, so that you can really get context on how um, COVID is doing in, in specific areas. Um, and that API um, is available in different formats. Um, it, you can view the data in the CSV format or, or a JSON format. You can slice it by um, viewing all data for all counties and, and so forth. Um, and what we've really found over the course of the pandemic is that it's really important to push data um, to people in different ways. Um, many people don't understand the, uh, many people understand data in their own respect. So, it really requires multiple different formats to be able to communicate that data effectively. Um, for example, we have a, a newsletter email that goes out um, uh, every day and called the daily download. And that has like a summary overview. And there's another email that we send out twice a week that's the research rundown. And that focuses on the summary of scientific findings. And those, those emails have very different audiences. And, and we really think it's important to find ways to make that data most accessible to different groups of people. Um, and so that kind of brings us on to our next point right, of what is data accessibility? Um, and when you think of data accessibility, uh, you might have a couple different ideas. Um, for me, data accessibility immediate, immediately brings up web accessibility. And web accessibility involves making your websites, uh, breaking down those barriers to people who may have physical disabilities or situational disabilities or uh, socioeconomic restrictions on the bandwidth or speed of websites. Um, and web accessibility, really the point of making websites accessible is to break down all those barriers and, and make that website available to everyone. Um, and data accessibility is very similar in that regard. Um, it includes web accessibility or it can include web accessibility, but um, it's not just limited to that. Um, and the way that I'm defining data accessibility is I'm defining it as it's the ability to access and benefit from data. And so the benefit part is key. Um, just because that data is available doesn't mean that someone can necessarily benefit from it. Um, and they, users need to be able to really derive value and not just see that you have the data, but truly understand what that data is and know how they can apply it. Um, and something that is important is that data accessibility really does look very different for different users. So here's a couple examples. Um, if you take two personas of one being a software engineer and another one being a concerned citizen who's trying to understand the COVID in their area, um, the same data format might not be accessible for both people. So for instance, if a software engineer is trying to use COVID data to build um, their, their own derivative works, the data dashboard might not be the most accessible version for them. Uh, it requires a lot more additional tools to basically build 
that data and, and put it in a format where they're able to use it. Um, whereas JSON, a structured version of that data, is like much more accessible. And so uh, for them, that's the right way of making that same, potentially same data accessible to them. Similarly, for a concerned citizen, uh, just a JSON structure with, with raw numbers may be wildly confusing and, and not easy to see what's actually happening. Whereas a dashboard that is um, configurable and they can really work with to, to understand the data is accessible for them. Um, and so data accessibility is not just a single checklist, um, but it, it, it varies per what, for different users. Um, but you will find that data accessibility, there's common characteristics that, that it needs for people to basically be able to use that data. Um, and these are, I think of as, as principles that you can keep in mind to make sure that your data is really able to reach the most people possible. Um, yeah, and so first off, accessible date COVID data is specific. And what that really means is that specific data is, it's clearly defined or identified. And people must be able to really identify what the data is you're actually communicating. And as you're probably aware, COVID data has a remarkable way of making everything extremely confusing. What you think might be a simple point turns out is, is very unclear and hard to interpret. Um, and so it's really, really critical that, that COVID data is specific and uh, in what you're sharing. Um, and so when data is specific, it reduces confusion. Uh, here's an example that we ran into um, around test positivity. So on the left here, you see the test positivity for, uh, for Connecticut. Um, and uh, the, test, the one on the left is the test positivity that we were showing on COVID Act Now site. And on the right is the test positivity that the state of Connecticut was showing on their dashboard. Um, and you can see that there's about a 1% a difference between what we're showing and what the Department of Health was showing. And so this raises a lot of questions immediately. Um, why are those numbers different? Who is right? If you're showing this number and I see a different number that's different, how can I trust what you're showing um, when another source is showing me something different? And so it's really important that you recognize that the lack of specificity will really increase confusion and you want people and people will come with questions and by providing specific data, you will be able to help users understand or answer their own questions. Um, and so let's look at a way to resolve this. Um, if you share the methodology for how you're computing certain metrics or values, um, that can really help make your data more specific and accessible to other users. So for instance, um, here we explain that we calculate the test positivity rate as a seven day trailing average. Um, whereas the state of Connecticut mentions that daily test positivity is the number of new positive molecular and antigen cases divided by the number of new molecular and antigen tests reported in the past 24 hours. Um, so as you can see, this gives a lot more insight into what, where the differences lie. Um, first of all, the state of Connecticut is just taking the past 24 hours. So right away, that could be one possible reason for why these, these numbers are different. Um, secondly, they are including both molecular and antigen cases. Um, and although we don't say it here, which we should, um, but our test positivity is only molecular tests. Um, and so right away, that's, that's by sharing the methodology, you're able to help users narrow in and focus in on what that data is. Um, and so sometimes, as you can see, this can get complicated very quickly. Um, being specific is actually, it turns out it's very difficult. Um, test positivity in particular has a variety of pitfalls. Um, for instance, there are multiple types of COVID tests. Um, there are molecular tests or PCR tests, as you might know them. There are antigen tests um, and there are serological tests. Um, each of these tests have different properties. So the state of Connecticut, when they're reporting their COVID data, they're combining PCR and antigen tests. And so their number is lower because typically antigen tests have, have a lower test positivity. But that is difficult to know if you can't even understand what the data point is. Additionally, there are different ways of calculating test positivity. 
So for example, um, you, can, you can calculate the numerator as being the total tests that are positive. You can calculate the numer numerator as being the number of people that have tested positive. Um, while that might seem like it should be the same, it's not always the same. People could get multiple tests in say a certain week. Similarly, the denominator can be either of those values. And so when you're communicating these, these metrics, it's really difficult to be specific with a lot of this data. Um, and so to help do this better, <laughs> one thing I recommend is to lean on good documentation and find really good examples of, of other organizations that are, that are potentially experts in this, being able to present this data in a way that is very specific and is easy to understand. Um, so for example, um, Texas, they have a really good, they, overall their data presentation is great. Um, so for test positivity, they define it as molecular, or they say that molecular test positivity rate by specimen collection date. Right away, that is important to being able to understand what this value is. Um, in addition, they go down, they, they provide an additional page that gives you more context. So sometimes when you're trying to present specific data in the actual uh, metric itself, there might not be space for it. But if you, if you have a separate page where you can explain more about what that data point is, you can point users towards it um, and, that, and that can be helpful. Um, additionally, uh, specific data lets users apply that data in other contexts. Um, and this can really help you broaden your reach that you're having with this data. So for instance, on Covidec now, we have a feature that's a compare table. So it, it, you can compare the metrics across different states. For test positivity, it's really, really important that all these, that we're comparing the same numbers across different um, metrics, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to uh, actually compare what the test positivity is in California to say what the test posit positivity is in, in, in uh, Connecticut. Um, and it's important to realize that the data that you're releasing, and especially with COVID data, is part of a larger community of data publishers. Other users of your users may be presenting your data in ways that you never imagined, but you're part of this larger effort. And so it's really important that you do the work to figure out what is it what makes my data specific and how can I communicate that? Um, additionally, accessible COVID data includes context. Um, and so context really gives users the tools that they need to better understand the data that you have. Um, it also adds guardrails to when they're interpreting the data. Uh, so for example, uh, the city of Cambridge uh, presents, they have a really great dashboard, but they present the new confirmed cases by event date. This is their chart, their primary chart that shows um, COVID spread in Cambridge, Mass. Uh, and what you'll see is um, <clears throat> that this data is specific. They, they outline that this is new confirmed cases by event date, but also this chart looks very similar to a lot of other charts you might see. Um, and so there are some traps here that, that aren't immediately obvious. Uh, so let's take a look at how they help provide context. So basically they say, they give this description and on it, it says, this chart reflects the event date for each new case. Hmm, that's interesting, what could that mean? Um, and they further clarify down below, as more information becomes available, case counts for individual dates going back in time may change. And for this reason, the number of new cases initially reported on a given day might shift to other dates. Now this is very, very crucial context because uh, it really helps users interpret what the data is that they're presenting. Um, if, they, if people don't have this context, they might take away the wrong points. For instance, as you can see there on the latest day, um, there are zero new cases. Uh, and it turns out that this might be just because for that reporting date, all the, all the data that they're reporting, the events happened earlier. So people might look at this and if they don't have that context, they can take away the wrong information that, oh, there's no new cases today. I can live my life freely. <laughs> Whereas we know that that is not the case and uh, the data is actually saying something different. Um, additionally, adding context can really review new case, reveal new information. Um, so example, on COVID Act Now, we have a feature where you can compare uh, data series for across different regions. And currently I'm in Florida and 
I pulled up the comparison of data for um, Florida, Sarasota County, the county I'm in, and the metro area that I'm in. Um, and as you can see on the left, this data just presented raw does not provide a lot of, it's, there's not much additional information about um, that helps me understand my situation specifically. So what we do is we normalize that data by the population. So on the right, you'll see a chart that is daily new cases normalized by population. And here you can see how immediately this data has more impact. Um, you're able to communicate a very different thing and the data is mostly the same. It's just the way that you're presenting it is quite different. Um, and this is just a little, a little bit of information. It's not a ton, but, but it really shows that this context can change how people um, use your data and can influence the, the insights that they're taking away from it. Um, additionally, Adding historical data is extremely important to adding context. Um, on the left, you'll see the overview of, of daily new cases. Um, and you'll see that we have in Massachusetts currently, the daily new cases is 29.1 per 100,000. Um, and this is helpful, but it, without that context, without more context, it's difficult to understand what that data point means. Um, so if we're looking at the, the historical data of this, you can see that 29.1 acts very differently depending on the context where you are. Um, if you're a Massachusetts resident, you might be able to understand this data in different ways. For example, if you look now, cases are about five times what they were in the summer, even though just a month ago, they were about, let's see, uh, five times what they are now. So but this historical data really gives people the ability to bring their own experiences, bring their own knowledge and derive what they want to and what they're able to based on, um, based on your data. And so without that, without that extra um, context, they might not know what 29.1 means, but it really gives an opportunity to give people an on-ramp to understanding uh, current data. Um, additionally, context really works to remove potential stumbling blocks. Um, so this graphic is a really helpful graphic I find from uh, the COVID, COVID tracking project. And they uh, put out a, a series of recommendations for a national pandemic dashboard um, a couple months ago. And what I like about this, this, is, this chart that you see is the New York Times uh, case data chart. Um, and by providing all these different little uh, hints and, and helper text and uh, annotations, they're really able to remove various different potential stumbling blocks. And what you'll find is that different people have different stumbling blocks. So for instance, um, the New York Times presents uh, data anomalies in a different color. Um, and for, for myself, who I've been working with the data very, very closely for <laughs> the past few months or the past year, and I might have bring a lot more context to what those anomalies could be, or even that that is an anomaly. If a lot of times what happens is, is, is states will report a backlog of cases. So on one day, it looks like the cases are spiking, but in reality, they're not. But without communicating that to people through an annotation, that is an additional hurdle that someone who's trying to interpret this data will run into. Um, and so it's very important when you're thinking about how you're presenting your data, to think about all the different ways that people who have different experiences and who have different um, sets of assumptions and different levels of sophistication, how are they interpreting the data and what will really be stumbling blocks for them to understanding this data? Um, and, and I think the New York Times does a really great job of this because they provide very complete and it shows how, how much effort they put into making this data um, accessible to people. Uh, and so carrying on with this, it kind of data also, accessible COVID data is also available in multiple different formats. Um, one size does not fit all for COVID data. Um, so for example, here is a, a Microsoft BI dashboard that Microsoft has put out about vaccine data. Um, and what they do really well is they provide a dashboard, which is great and I highly encourage it, but um, they don't just provide that dashboard, they add an easy link to download the data behind the dashboard right next to the dashboard itself. 
Um, and what you'll find is that different data formats really help expand your data, your reach, um, because very different people have very different ways of accessing your COVID data. So for instance, business intelligence dashboards like Tableau dashboards, Power BI dashboards, or um, ArcGIS dashboards, they're really helpful and they serve a, a crucial role in communicating data. Oftentimes they will, they're easy, they're easier for people who might not have as much web development experience to present very interactive charts um, and get the data that people have out there to the public. Um, but they also have drawbacks. They're, a lot of times they're very difficult for people to access that data and apply it to their own context. So if you are a um, analyst at a company and you're making your reopening strategy, uh, you might just wanna be looking at certain, filter down that data to certain counties. And you might have data on like where your offices are. And so sometimes a, a BI dashboard might not be the right way to present that. And so it's, it's really important to present that same data in different ways because um, people are, are trying to make decisions based on the best available data they have. And oftentimes that, that involves bringing their own experiences and their own uh, expertise really to, um, to the data that you're providing. And unless you can let them really combine that in effective ways, um, it limits what people can do with your data. Um, and yeah, and so one more note about dashboards. <laughs> um, uh, dashboards don't always translate, translate well to different devices. So if you're on a mobile phone, for instance, the same John Hopkins dashboard just rescaled to mobile size does not present the data in a clear way. Now, fortunately, JHU actually, they have a separate mobile dashboard that is a completely different view of the data that's, that's tailored for mobile. But just presenting a, a, a dashboard might not get you all the way there. Um, and I think that's really important to understand and to think about when you're presenting this data um, because you want to increase the number of people that are able to use this data and without you know, thinking of the different ways that people are accessing it, um, it might not be as successful as you want. Um, so I just wanted to show a couple examples of people that have used ways that letting people download their data is helpful for you. Um, so on the left here, we have the Citizen app um, and the Citizen app, uh, they use our data to basically provide alerts and warnings, and they, they typically provide uh, local crime notifications, um, but they have also added COVID data in. And they're using the COVID Act Now API to basically power their dashboard or their, their app for that. Um, and what I think is really cool is that they are able to use our data and really tailor it for their audience. Um, and they can, they can produce really beautiful visualizations and um, leverage this additional community that, that can now benefit from this, this COVID data. Um, and on the right here, you have a spreadsheet from um, a church organization, a church denomination that covers the Pacific Northwest. Um, and what they do is they've built this, this Excel spreadsheet that basically pulls in data and it resummarizes and it picks out the parts that are important for them to help them guide their church reopening strategy. Um, and by, by having this data available to access, they're able to really figure out what's important for them and how they can communicate this to various churches across the Northwest. And I think this is a great example because it's really cool to see how other organizations are basically using this data that, that just pairs it down in ways that are useful for them. Um, so here's a few examples of other users who have signed up for the API um, and how they're using their data. So we have on the left, a, a teacher who's teaching his, his or her 10th grade students how to build phone apps with Dunkable. And some are choosing to create COVID tracking apps. So this is, I think, a good example of just an idea, trying to make that idea that people have as accessible and e as easy to make as possible. Um, in the middle, we have someone who wants to display COVID data on, on billboards. And you know, this has the ability to reach a bunch more people. Um, and on the right, you have someone who is uh, creating an automated text that will alert them when there's a new safe state available um, for traveling that follows Massachusetts travel guidelines. Um, and what I think is really 
what I really enjoy about this is that you can see that everyone is just trying to figure it out. Um, everyone's kind of coming to whatever COVID data is available from a slightly different angle. And COVID Act Now did not set out to develop COVID updates for billboards specifically. But this person who has a very valid idea and very valid um, uh, goal will now be able to make their, their vision possible. And I think the power of accessible data really comes in when people are able to approach your data and, and use it to, to help um, them fulfill their vision. Um, additionally, um, COVID data does follow best practices for web accessibility. Um, and this is kind of a, a just baseline where you can use accessible web practices to help as many people as possible be able to benefit from your data. Um, so for example, charts might be difficult to comprehend with screen readers. Um, a lot of times your typical presentation might not be interpreted. So people who um, are hard of seeing will not be able to understand or, or really learn about the data that you're presenting. Um, and so we found that by, by adding additional context and by adding text that explains what's in the chart, um, for example, it can really help uh, open up who our data can reach. Um, also, colorblindness is a huge problem with data presentations. Um, so I really like this, this visualization from uh, uh, Data Wrapper, which is a, a graphing tool of sorts. Um, and they kind of show how colorblindness really makes data hard to see. When you're relying on red green specifically, um, which is tempting to do because red has a general connotation of being bad and green has connotation of being good. And you wanna communicate when things are good or bad in a pandemic. Um, but that really limits to how you can communicate that, that same um, information to people who have colorblindness. Uh, and I think it does a good job of showing how uh, just how important having an accessible um, color palette can really help more people reach your data. Um, and I think that kind of summarizes where it's important to, to minimize all these barriers for people. And it's such a complicated topic to start with. And everything that makes data more difficult to access you'll be dropping up, people will be dropping off who can actually benefit from it. Awesome, so um, let's just summarize kind of some characteristics of accessible data. Um, we went through and said that data is, accessible data is specific. Um, we saw how complicated test positivity can be and how important it is to providing specifics on that data to making it useful for people. Um, Accessible data provides context. That context is just crucial for having people be able to really take the data into their own hands and understand what it means, while also providing guardrails for people who come with different backgrounds and assumptions. Um, without that context, people are not able to uh, really get the most out of your data or might use it incorrectly. Um, data is available in multiple formats. Uh, people come with their own expertise. Um, some formats, play in with people's own skills. And you want to really uh, present your data in ways that, that amplify and, and complement people's skills. Um, and also accessible data follows best practices for web accessibility. Um, so there are basic tips and, and practices you can really use to make your data accessible to as many people as possible. Um, awesome. Now I guess we can open it up for questions. And here is some contact information. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions afterwards or at any point. Um, feel free to send me an email, uh, contact me on Twitter or, or uh, whatever. And also with COVID Act Now, we have, um, you can feel free to email API COVID Act Now. That'll direct it to me and a couple other people or um, check out our website and API documentation. Wonderful, thank you so much, Chris. Um, one of the hardest things of these webinars is not having the applause at the end, uh, <laughs> but I, I know that this was uh, this is really fantastic. So we do have some questions coming in uh, and please do feel free to add your questions to the Q&A as well as you think of them. 
Um, and maybe we'll start. Uh, so Tom uh, has asked to you, uh, what can government data providers do to help organizations like yours that are trying to make this information accessible to the general public? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think there's a handful of things. One is that government data providers have a real opportunity because they <laughs> have the data themselves. And so they're choosing how to present that data. Um, the most, the thing that I look for most is providing raw data as much as possible um, and also providing caveats on what that data means. So a lot of times people may be hesitant to publish data because it might create things that are, um, uh, might create incorrect data points. But if you can communicate that those data points aren't right, um, that really helps make that information more accessible. Um, and additionally, uh, Government data providers, there's also a handful of uh, open uh, data access points. So for instance, healthdata.gov has a great um, summary of data sets. And so I think like the city of Chicago, for instance, they publish their data through that portal. Um, and so by, by leveraging these portals that are more um, open and uh, uh, that aggregate various forms of data, um, that's also, I think, pretty helpful. Great. Yeah. Um, wonderful. And do you do you think that like is it is it better like do you do you think that these governments should be pushing also to like have API feeds a, APIs available as well as CSVs or like how you know back to your comment about, about different formats as well like do these web do these aggregating websites provide ways to present the data in multiple styles. Yeah, so I, I think with um, with data with with government data providers, there's some limitations sometimes in a the the specific uh, capabilities of a, of a certain uh, department. Um, and sometimes you know what's what's ideal is not always possible. Um, and so while for me personally, having a, a clear API that is uh, that you know exposes the data in formats that that are easy for me to use are helpful. I think it's most important to, for for governments to really understand what capabilities they are and try to lean on consistency. And what I find is that a lot of times people are pretty familiar with um, with uh, spreadsheets, um, and so a lot of the data is is used in spreadsheets. And so if you can just surface those spreadsheets, I think that is really you know a lot of times organizations like ours we're able to uh, uh, kind of import spreadsheets in a much easier way than say, just a Power BI dashboard. Um, we've had to build a, a, lot of, a lot of tools to basically be able to interpret these, these dashboards. And so, um, but other people might not have the same skills. Um, and so, yeah. Great. Uh, and then uh, Andreas asked, so, you know, different visualizations of the same data can sometimes be confusing and then and and then this data also gets you know whatever you've put up gets propagated somewhere else um, and so these publishers also can struggle with with data visualization options and so he asks uh, have you thought at all about uh, making the data available via embeds um, and sort of web widgets and things so that other publishers can actually just, put your data up there directly without having to try and rejigger it or present it in some different way? Yeah, I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's a balance. Um, so we, we do provide a couple um, embed options actually. So you can embed say our, our map um, and you can also embed um, the headline metrics. Um, but I, I think the ways that you're providing for other people to share those data, share that data um, is really important. So for instance, um, we, we have a lot of uh, metadata on our on our links. So if you were to share a link in, say, a text message, um, you know, a, a screenshot of a chart would pop up. Um, and so you can. There's different ways that you can share this. Um, and I think what we struggle with is kind of, you know, putting in the effort, trying to identify the the highest value sorts of of ways to share the data, because as soon as you're you're uh, uh, sharing this. Um, you're kind of putting it out of your hands. So you have to make sure to carefully construct that, that it, that it still makes sense 
in a different context. Yeah. That sense, yeah. I think that makes a ton of sense, right? Because yeah, the anything that's taken from your site and put somewhere else doesn't have all of the other stuff that you have on your site to explain the data. And so you need to have, yeah, they, I do understand that's totally a balancing act and that's a very good point. Um, wonderful. So uh, somebody else said, you know, wanted to know about like the, uh, you know, how, how, do, how do organizations validate that the data that they're presenting is accessible? And how do you know, you know, these, all of these methods you shared, how do you know that they work? How do you know that they're the, they're the right things to do? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, I think that that validating is is tricky, and I think it's often kind of overlooked um, because it's easy to say, "I have to make this visualization. I need to get it out. I got it out. Okay, we're done. We'll move on to the next thing." Um, so a lot of what it involves is kind of understanding who your audience is. Um, so if you have a county dashboard, for instance, who is coming to that page? Um, are you working with parents? who are looking for COVID metrics for school reopenings. Um, if you're doing that, you can validate them by asking, <laughs> by just reaching out and asking some people who might be using your data, hey, is this clear? Does this make sense? Are you able to understand what, what questions do you have about this? Um, and also another way that you can validate is by taking a look at what questions you get from outsiders, because typically um, where people are asking about are even if it's not specifically relating to what you're saying are are things that they're not able to get themselves um, from that data. And uh, there's a great World War II picture um, or a great uh, image from World War II and it was of a plane and it showed all the places where crash planes were, were shot at. And it has like a, I, this would be much more effective if I had the visual. But it's basically that people were like, oh, planes are being shot at um, in these spots. So we should be adding more, or no, it, it, sorry, <laughs> let me correct that. It was planes that had survived, but had bullet holes in them. And they're like, oh no, we need to add more um, armor to these places that had bullet, bullet holes because this is where um, planes are being shot. And it's like, no, actually, ah, yes, there we go. Um, it turns out that those spots were actually places where the plane was resilient to. So they weren't having data from the other side because people weren't even able to um, see, <laughs> you know, the planes that were that were shot down didn't were shot in those other spots. Um, and so I think, you know, it's it's making it clear what um, using the the data that you have to be. Uh, so that kind of applies, but I would say that if people are even able to ask questions about your data the complexity of those questions determines how much they're able to know. So if they aren't asking questions, it might mean they don't understand it at all. Um, and so they're just skipping by it and not even trying to engage with it. When you get more specific questions, you get questions that are um, really, uh, you know, give you insight into how people are understanding your data. Um, and so we at COVID Act Now, we rely on a lot of user feedback um, uh, to kind of get this and then we see, we work with a lot of organizations. And so we are able to kind of see from a broad um, overview of what we think people actually need. Um, so that's one of the ways we do that as well. And so as you're getting this user feedback, um, right, one of the things that you mentioned before was the variety of different users you have. So how do you balance, like when you're getting conflicting information or uh, feedback from them? Um, it's it's definitely not easy, um, but I think that at some point you have to decide what is this graphic or what is this this visualization? Who is it actually serving? So sometimes you might be trying to serve too much with one reading of the data. If if uh, it does everything, it likely serves no no one. Um, so really trying to find the the specifics and the points that are um, able to communicate in a specific way. So. And that's why I think it's really important to present that data in multiple different formats, because some people might be able to understand data in one way, but it might take a different visualization for a different group of people to understand it. Yeah, makes total sense. Uh, and so then uh, Chuck uh, 
wanted to ask, you know, so certain certain data types, and he brings up the example of outbreaks in senior care facilities have very different reporting frequencies, uh, right? So when you're lucky, you get that data daily, but oftentimes it's weekly, maybe longer. Um, there's a lot of inconsistency in how the data gets gets published. How do you handle that? How do you address that kind of variability in the data getting published? Um, and still make sure that what you are presenting is useful for decision making? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it's something that we run into all the time, um, as you said, uh, with uh, senior care facilities. Um, the Center, Center for Medicare Services, I think, they released county level test positivity um, every two weeks. So one of the requirements of that was for senior care facilities, they had to release this data. Um, but yeah, so that was that was biweekly. And um, I think the frequency of the data really is important to what sorts of decisions you're trying to, to drive. Um, because citizen decision making, you know, can look very, very different. Um, whereas case case rates are much more important to be immediately to immediately um, uh, change your behavior. If the COVID is very high right now, you need to take action. Um, but for instance, even hospital data, uh, that, that is an effect of a multi-week lag. Um, so if you have low, if you have high hospital utilization or ICU utilization, there really isn't much you can do when it's high to change that number if you're not a hospital, um, <laughs> um, to change, to help influence that number, that won't immediately. So that data is more helpful for for trying to plan in advance. So it's much better that when the, when those numbers are lower, that you're able to realize that trends are changing. Um, and I think that it's, so how you communicate what those metrics are used for plays a large part in that. Um, and I think also you need to, you know, communicate the frequency that that data is updating. Um, don't say, basically communicate like a, a date of date. Um, because if you say, oh, hospitals are at 100%, but that data was from two weeks ago, uh, people might take away the wrong uh, takeaway. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So it's really back to, back to your point about context, back to your point about annotations, making sure that you've got explainers there um, and, and trying to figure out different ways to handle uh, handle what you've got and present what you have, but make sure it's clear that it might not be perfect. Uh, and, and so I've got a question for you, right? So you all are an open source project. So why did you decide to open source COVID Act now? And what's what have you seen at, have been the, the outcomes of that decision? Yeah, so I was not around when the decision to open source COVID Act now was was made, but I actually benefited it, benefited from it being open source. Um, at the beginning, especially like a year ago, everything was a scramble. So it was, how do we solve this problem right now? And how do we get the most people available helping out solving this problem right now? Um, and so I actually got involved by um, finding the GitHub repo and contributing directly to it. Um, and so I just started volunteering and I was able to kind of hop in and, uh, and so I think that was really important to help widen the net of who's able to participate in this, in this process. And you're able to kind of uh, really draw uh, help from multiple different places. Um, so for instance, yes, yeah, so that, that was one big thing I'd say. Um, another part is in transparency. So with this open data, with open data, so with COVID numbers, the data is sometimes hard to, to trust or people, uh, won't trust what the data, how the data was made. Um, and so by having open source, it's really uh, easy to introspect. Um, and so we could go to organizations and say, here's our infection rate um, metric, and here's the code that we're using for how we're calculating it. Um, and so it really, you know, it gives more context in that case to the data that, that we're producing. Um, and so I think, and then also a third reason is that it really gives people the ability to uh, uh, take it and use it for their own purposes. So because it's open source, like all of our data pipelines are open source. So if you have enough technical skills, you can reduplicate what we're doing 
and tailor it for your specific experience. Um, and while this is a much more difficult and we haven't spent maybe as much time as we should have, making that as easier for other developers. Um, and, uh, but it, it's, it's a way that you can, you can put the power and, and uh, insights in, in more people's hands. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. And I think that, do you know, has any, have any other countries forked your code? Do you know? Oh, that's a good question. We have definitely had people fork our code, but um, I, I, it's been some organizations or some businesses who have forked it to either run a specific model or, um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe this will be the uh, inspiration to, yeah. to end up with, with COVID deck now on a different continent. Um, and, and so uh, an another question from the audience, uh, what's next for COVID act now? How are you hoping to grow and evolve? And is there anything exciting on the, on the horizon? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, what I think is unique or what's been, I think everyone who's involved, been involved in uh, COVID in the COVID response has found is that every month is like a different year, basically, um, where what's needed at a specific time is very, very different um, from where it was in the past. Um, and so, a lot of what we're doing right now is focusing on vaccine rollout. Um, and so trying to provide vaccine data at a local county level um, and providing the resources that people need to help figure out um, where they can get vaccinated and where um, uh, where all that data is, you know, how, how they can help other people get vaccinated. Um, and so uh, right now that's our focus. It's hard for me to say exactly what that will look like. Um, in the future, uh, I think you'll have to stay tuned to see what, <laughs> what comes next. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think with that, Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, this was fantastic. Thank you so much to our audience. It's great to see so many people attend uh, and participate, so many good questions. And um, we will be sharing the slides and the recording of this uh, on our website, uh, as well as everybody who's registered will get an email with them. If you have follow-up questions, please let us know. And uh, we hope that you get involved with LFPH and with COVID Act Now, and uh, we will see you again soon. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this is great.